My name is Carrie Tomlin, and my official title at Think Academy and for the school system is that I'm the Workforce Development Manager. Um, as part of my role, what I do is I manage the work-based learning program. Does anybody know what work-based learning is? You do. You do. You do. Yeah, because you guys have participated in it. Work-based learning is a program within your high school system that allows you to work while you're in high school, earn academic credit, and generally earn money um, while you're in high school. We try to align your job with your academic and your long-term goals. Um, however, we have students who work, um, who are studying healthcare and work at Wendy's, and there's a lot of value in that too, and we're gonna talk about that. Um, so, uh, I want to introduce uh, Jennifer Pike and give her a second or a minute to introduce herself and tell you a little bit about what she does. Then we'll get started on Life 101. I'm Jennifer Pike. I have supervised um, counseling and academic advising since 2000. And eight. So I do have a lot of experience um, in the school system in terms of dual enrollment, applying to college, looking for scholarships. But really my main goal, I think, is I do mesh, think, um, college and career academy schedules. I make them work with the high school. And then I schedule all work-based learning and I schedule all dual enrollment and transcribe those grades. So that's my role and um, I just hope that you all get something out of it that's valuable. We were asked to come and talk to you guys about Life 101, and I was a little blown away because I'm 40 years old, and I'm not sure that I understand um, life. It's always a, uh, every day is new. Um, that's part of what's exciting uh, about it. Um, but we want to touch on a couple of things that we hope are helpful and meaningful to you um, when it comes to life because the important thing about life is, is gaining experience. Um, surviving that and being able to live and tell and share that with other people. So we're going to start tonight, um, we're going to start at the beginning, we're going to go all the way back and we're going to start with a video maybe. If it, We're going to start with a video because from a very early age uh, you guys have been pondering a question. We all have been. Do you, anyone know what it is? What are you going to be when you grow up? Exactly. So we're going to hear what some young people um, think they want to be when they grow up. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. What do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be... Hey, I never think I thought of that. Uh, let me think about that. Whoa. I want to be a teacher when I grow up. Elementary teacher. I like little kids. A babysitter. A pastor. A dolphin trainer. A gentle without each bunch. A hair cutter. A person who helps ch in charities. Only cash you at Walmart. An author. Chapter books about mythical creatures and animals and things. I want to be a lawyer. Lawyer. Pilot. Pilot. Pilot? And a dad? A pilot racer dad? Scientist. Scientist. Paleontologist. Mind for dinosaur bones and studies them. YouTuber. Movie star. A famous actor. 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 <laughs> On stage. On TV. On Disney Channel. Or commercials. I gotta be a model. Model. Oh, work it. If I want a model, I'll just be a policeman. <laughs> police. 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 Police officer. I got on the car chases. Cash bad guys. A superhero. Batman. By the man. I would like to go into the U.S. Army because my grandma, she loved the Army, but she never went into the service. I want to be the third African American gymnast. Gymnastic coach. I want to be a professional dancer. 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 Dance teacher. Ballerina. Professional soccer player. I have a shirt on right now that says Barcelona. Soccer player. Basketball player. Basketball, football, or soccer player. Or I baseball. I can never choose. Mm -hmm. I do not know. I'm still working on that. Maybe when I grow up, I'll pick. I already have a whole plan. So the Air Force for 20 years. Become a businessman, make my own company for cars. I want to be a Pokemon trainer. I want to work at Target. I want uh, 
a cake. I want to be a pop star. Rock star. Singer. 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 A singer. Uh, I want to be a cook. A cook. But I don't really know how to actually cook. I want to be an artist. Artist. Painter. I want to be an artist that goes around painting walls. A artist and a video game maker. Video game designer. Video game. I want to be a filmmaker. Um, whatever my dad is. Oh, do you know what your dad is? I'm not sure. I'll be a doctor. 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 A mermaid. A mermaid doctor. Hmm. Heart surgeon. Neurosurgeon. Cardiologist. Gynecologist. Pediatrician. The kid's doctor. Pediatrician. And why do you want to do that? I want to be a doctor and then I can wear rainbow sweatpants. I really want to be a nurse. Everyone says you have to be very good at science and math. I'm not really, but I still want to be one. I want to be a pet doctor because I like helping animals. Pet vet. Pet vet. Veterinarian. Veterinarian. Zoologist. Princess fairy zookeeper. How much do you think they get paid? $29. So what's so great about young children talking about what it is they think they want to do when they grow up? They're naive. What else? They don't really know what they want. What'd you say? <laughs> no, mermaid doctors aren't a thing. But they have a dream, right? They have an idea in their head. <clears throat> what we learn as we grow up is that the expectations are very clear and straightforward. But what does reality look like? It's a little messier than what we thought as a child. There is a road to get where we want to go. So how do we get where we want to go? Who here knows what they want to be when they grow up? Somebody said, this one right here. you said, you know, you have a plan. What's your plan? I want to be an aviation mechanic for Delta. Awesome. Great. And you have a plan? Yes. What's I your plan? A, I, I don't know where I'm going to go yet, but yeah, I have to find a school. That specializes in aviation. Does anybody else know exactly what they want to do or think they know? What do you want to do? Okay, and why do you want to do that? Uh, I've always had the desire to want to be in the medical field, and I always had the desire to want to help others, and mostly in the building, like working with children and mothers. Great. Anybody else know what they want to do or how they're getting there? What about you guys? I want to go into game development. I took the pathway, I think. So. Okay. All right. So you have a path. I want to be a nurse practitioner for, for pediatrics. Okay. Are you at Think in Healthcare too? I tried. I, I think it is. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so that's a question that is posed to us from the time we can all remember. What do you want to be when you grow up? But as you get older, what becomes really important is figuring out how are you going to get there. And those ideas change. They do. Well, whoever feels like this, whoever feels overwhelmed with the options, uh, feel overwhelmed? Do you know what you want to do? No. And it's overwhelming, isn't it? So let me ask you a question. How many ways is there to get to one destination? Who drives to LaGrange High School every day? Emma, how do you get there? Uh, I drive like from my, I mean. Give us some roads. Oh, so, well, I don't know roads. <laughs> my house is like two minutes away, I can walk. Okay. But like I go down like by the track and then <laughs> take a right. And then I go up by the, yeah, I'm, down, I'm down by the flower street and I go up the flower street and I go by the track. Then I turn by the basketball like court over there. And then I. And you park near a road. Who else drives the LaGrange? How do you get there? Um, so I go from Broad to Springdale and then Bridge there. And you there? Who else drives to LaGrange? How do you get there? Well, I go down Country Club and then <laughs> I turn down Piney Woods and then go down those other roads like Emma was talking about. Okay, so the great thing is that a lot of times there's one destination. But there are more than one way to get there, and that is life. It can be overwhelming, but one of the most important things to do is what? Get up and get on the road. That's how you get there. What do you do if a road's blocked? Find way around it. You, you find another way. Life is exactly the same way, and sometimes we have to explore what our options are. 
I'm going to run through the curriculum that we go over in work-based learning. We cover it in a year. We're going to do it in about 40 minutes. So we're going to move real quickly. But we talk about a process in work-based learning because work-based learning is about self-discovery, career exploration, and all of that. So we start um, with getting to know ourselves and self-awareness. Does anybody know why that's important? Why is self-awareness important? Because you can choose what field. How do you, why can you choose? Because you know what you're good at. You know what you're good at. You know, you you know yourself. What would you say? You know what you like. You know what you like. What about what you don't like? Yeah. What role does that play? Just don't do it. Right, exactly. And that's a very important part of the piece of the puzzle. There are students at Think Academy who want to go into healthcare, but the sight of blood bothers them. The thought of changing dirty uh, pans bothers them. Some of them only want to work with young children. They don't want to work with the elderly. So knowing what you like and what you don't like is critical to your success and getting on a road and, and getting to your destination. It's part of the process. There's a tool that students in work-based learning, when I was uh, managing the program and, and teaching the program that we used, and it was called 16 Personalities, and it's a um, personality profile. It's an online quiz that you can take, 16personalities.com. It's based on Carl Jung's theory of psychological types, which are introversion and extroversion. Does anybody know what an introvert is? What? Someone that prefers to lack social interaction with others and prefer to be alone. Okay, good. What about an extrovert? The opposite. So what is an extrovert like? They'd rather go have, you know, hang out with other people and be social. What do you think I am? Next yeah, exactly. 16 Personalities is based on Carl Jung, and it's also based on the Myers Briggs type indicator. So I'm going to show you my profile and I want you guys to tell me what you think about me based on my profile. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about it so you have an idea. So I'm a campaigner. I'm 81% extroverted. So you're right. I like people. I get a lot of energy from being around people. Energy. I'm intuitive. Nature, I'm more feeling than I am thinking. So what does that mean? You tend to go with your gut and think about a rational decision. Mm. Go with yeah. your gut and think about it. <laughs> That's right, yeah. And if you say something, you might hurt my feelings or I might react differently. Yes, and that's, we're going to talk about how that could play in the workplace because it's interesting. Tactics, um, those are traits that reflect our approach to work. And I'm more prospecting. And then my identity, I'm more assertive, meaning that um, I, I'm okay with confrontation. So what could you tell me based on my personality profile that I, you think I might like to study in school? Teaching. What? Teaching. Teaching? Yeah, because I like to be in front of people. I like to be around people. Great. What else? Communications. Yes. <laughs> my major and minor were communications. I got, well, I got organizational minor and uh, master's in technical communication. So good. Anyone else? Can you tell me anything else that you might know from my profile? I'm good at managing people. Managing people. I'm, well, yeah, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> but I love art because I'm creative and very feeling. So those are the kind of things that you can um, learn about yourself from doing something like this. It's not, um, it's a tool that you can put in your toolbox to learn a little bit about yourself. It's not 100%, but you'd be surprised at how accurate it is and how much information it gives you when you start thinking about yourself and the classes you want to take, the schools you want to attend because of the programs they offer, and then the jobs that you might want to pursue. Because you spend about 40 hours plus a week in a job, it's very, very important that you find something that you enjoy and that you get some, uh, some pleasure out of doing. So I, I want to chime in right here. How many of you have participated and taken the U Science assessment? Is that that thing? No, it's the U Science thing, Ella. <laughs> um, nobody? Wow, okay. I don't know the title, but we probably have. 
Well, youth science is something that they have offered the past four years at all of the base high schools. Um, this year, I think they're doing it with 10th graders. Um, it is a long assessment. It's about a two-hour assessment. I've taken it, and it's it's the the most dead on that that I've ever taken, and I've taken a lot of these things. You science is talking a little bit. It's it's a little bit about your personality, but a little bit more about your aptitude what you are good in. Um, it's important to know what you are good in as well. Not to say that if you're not good in science and math that you can't be a doctor. I'm not going to say that. What I'm going to tell you is it's going to be more difficult for that to happen. So you need to have, when we're talking about there's a lot of different ways to get to the same destination, you need to have a plan in place that may help you overcome obstacles that you may have that others may not have. Um, so it's really important that what your interest in can align with what you're pretty good in too. If if you're at a public high school, um, Springwood LaGrange Academy, they may have it for you too. I'm not sure about your schools. Ask your counselors if you can take you science. Um, not only will it tell you your aptitude, not only will it tell you a little bit about your personality, it will then take you to every profession that aligns with that, tell you where those job openings are, where where the most dense communities are, and how much you're going to make. So great, great tool. Yeah, we have a lot of resources um, that we can share with you beyond this presentation if you guys are interested. Um, so beyond self-awareness, the next step is connecting with other people because your network of people in life, right now your family base is your greatest network. Hopefully, in, in general, and hopefully it stays that way. But you need to expand your network. High school, school does that. You expand your network. You make friends. Somebody said they have new friends. You meet teachers. You meet people in the community that works. You need to expand your network. You do that again if you go off to college, if you go directly into the workforce or military. So connecting with people is very important in life in general. We are gregarious people, whether we're introvert or extrovert. However, there are a lot of challenges when it comes to connecting with people. We speak at a rate of about 150 words per minute, but we hear at a rate of about 1,000 words per minute. And we're going to do a quick exercise to demonstrate the instability and inaccuracy of only using verbal communication because there's more than just verbal communication. What's something else? Nonverbal communication, right? What are some nonverbal communication things? Body language. What else? Braille. Braille. That's right. That's right. What else? Like seeing sign language, your vision, how you look, how you carry yourself, all of those things. So we communicate a lot without actually speaking. And if you only rely on what we say, you're really shortchanging yourself. So we're going to do a quick. Um, activity just to demonstrate how unreliable verbal communication can be and why you need to work on your nonverbal commu communication too. So remind me of your name? Molly. I'm going to show Molly, I'm going to show her a, a, a rumor and she's going to tell Zoe. Zoe Zoe's going to go to the next table, and we're going to pass it around as fast as we can, okay? So Molly, come over here. Somebody gets a dollar more than somebody. That's all I heard. That's all. That's all you got. That's all I got, for real. Okay, so now we're going to listen to what the real rumor was. Pay attention. 
Susie makes $1.50 more than John, uh, even though John has been working at ABC Company for five months longer than Susie. Susie had more experience than John, but John has a college degree. I heard Susie made even more money at her last job, and she had to take a pay cut to work here. I bet she will be promoted quickly. Hey, we had it. Oh, <laughs> All right, give me, your, give me your attention. That is why verbal communication alone is unreliable, okay? We need to be aware of our nonverbal communication too. 7% of what we communicate is based on our vocabulary use. 38% is based on our tone of voice and our voice inflection. So we can say, wow, or we can say, wow. And it means something totally different. But 55% of what we communicate is based on our nonverbal behavior. So you can say something, but if your body language and your nonverbal communication is saying something different, you're going to send a mixed message, and it can very easily be, lo be lost. <clears throat> OK, so we're going to go on to the next, the next slide. And we're going to talk about a really important thing when it comes to connecting with others, and that's building trust. And I put a quote there for you guys. Building trust is a process. Trust results from consistent and predictable interactions over time. Why is building trust so important in our relationships? In school, at work, at home. Why is it important? What should you be consistent and predictable in? And just <laughs> what others like say and your coworkers and your friends like you should those should be consistent. Okay, so let's look at work. That's a good idea. That's that's a good start. Let's look who has a job in here. All right, what time do you show up to work? When you're scheduled. What time do you show up to work? When I'm scheduled. Okay. Oh <laughs> what time do you show up to work? 2.15. Is that on time? Uh, it's earlier than. Early. Yeah, you show up earlier on time. Does anybody have work with someone who shows up late? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> How does that? What kind, of, what kind of environment does that create when it's consistent? A bad one? Other people have to work longer, so the person that doesn't get there on time, like, so they have a position to do. Right. Yeah. How many of you have ever worked in a group? A group project at school, at church, in your family? When you're in a group of three or four people, how many people actually do the work? Yes. What kind of environment does that create when we talk about trust? It's a, you really, you can say it's a trusting one because you can trust a person to do the work, but then you can say it's un, you can't trust a person because they're not doing the work. Right. And someone has to do it. And most people, whether it is a personal relationship or a professional relationship, if you're consistently late, if you have a friend that calls and says, I want to do something, and then they never show up, or they always bail on you, that makes you second guess the trust. If you have a boss who tells you you need to be on time and comes squealing in on two wheels late every day, what do you think is going to happen? You're going to think it's okay to come in late. I would. I would think that would be okay. Well, if the boss is doing it, surely I could do it. What if you had a teacher that came in and said, you got to turn your assignments in on time, but then they never posted your grades on time? You, I see some faces that you may know this. So there are certain things in life, Life 101, that we need to be consistent and predictable in. And that's our behavior. And that builds trust in relationships, whether it's personal or professional. That builds trust. And it affects how we perform. So when we talk about leadership... In life, we go through life transitioning from being a leader to being a follower. And you'll do that throughout life. And it's important to understand those roles and how to transition them. But leading others um, is a, a very important role that you need to take some pride in. 
Because whether or not you realize it, especially you upperclassmen, there are people looking up to you. How many of you have younger siblings? Younger cousins? There are people looking up to you. And what you do, they're watching. And they're mirroring what you do. There's a, 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 a philosophy and the law of magnetism and the law of emulation that the mirror effect um, it's called the power of example, and magnetism is that leaders attract who they are, not who they want, and that like attracts like. So if I'm in a position of leadership, let's say I'm your teacher, and Emma had me as a teacher so she can vouch for this, and I show up every day late for our meetings, or I cancel all our meetings, and I say, well, I'm not going to be here. I show up late, and I say, I don't know what's going on today. Oh, my gosh, my life is crazy. Like... And you, but you know, show up and I'm like, you have to do all your things, but I'm totally out of whack. What do you think the message I'm sending to Emma and to my other students? Well, you're gonna do you're, yeah, you're going to be like, we don't really need to do what this lady's asking us to do. So the law of magnetism is that you attract who you are, not who you want. So if I want to attract students and get them on board with me being on time, being trustworthy, all those things, I need to be that way too. And you attract people when you do that. The law of emulation is that people do what people see. So if I do that, the idea is that other people will get on board and do that too. That's why it's important, because it actually works the other way too. If I come into our meetings totally discombobbled, don't know what's going on, Eventually, I'm going to create that type of culture in my classroom, too. That happens at work. It happens in families. So it's important to understand how um, leadership affects um, your role. And the other thing with, uh, what I love about this picture is that it kind of takes you back to understanding who you are. Because at times in life, we feel like a little kitten. But if you know who you are, you can present yourself like a lion or a tiger or a coo or whatever that is. But with that confidence, um, if you know who you are. So it's important to project that as a leader. All right, so we're going to do another activity. But um, when it comes to leading others, one of the most important things for leaders is to help people understand how uh, to manage their priorities. I tell my students this. And I pick on Emma because she ha had me, but you can vouch for it. I say this all the time. You guys are young. Right now in your life is the least amount of responsibility you will ever have. So the sooner in life that you can start practicing good habits when it comes to managing your priorities, the better. So we're going to do a little activity. Um, there is another principle. It's called 80-20. Um, it's when you practice the right pri priorities, 20% of your effort gets you 80% of your desired results. And I gave you some examples. 20% of, of your time produces 80% of the results. 20% of the people do 80% of the work. That's what we were talking about in group of five. There's two or three that do the work. Leadership, 20% of the people make 80% of the decisions. Who works? Where do you work? Starbucks. How many people work there? About almost 20. How many are in charge? Six. Yeah, see? It's true. So when we think about our priorities, we want to think about them in categories of big, and we're going to use rocks as an example. So who wants to be my guinea pig and come up here? Come on, Virginia. Oh, you're right up here. Okay. So we're going to talk about rocks. We're, we're using this as a metaphor for our priorities. So what are some of your big rock priorities? Work, school, and social life. Work, school, social life is a big priority? Okay. All right. What would be some of your medium size? Um. Mediums, okay, big priorities, and I'm not saying you're wrong because there's no right or wrong, but big priorities, what are some of the things that you need to have in place to have a social life? Friends. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so don't you think a big rock should maybe be friends? All right, you put the big rock in the jar. Okay, I'm not going to break it. No, you won't. So what would be another big rock? School. School. Why is school important? 
because it determines my future. That's right. Okay, what would be another big rock? Family. Family, yeah. Family, good. What else? What if you're sick? Yes, health. Okay, so that might be a big rock. Okay, so the big rocks are generally the things that we don't really like doing. They take the most amount of time and energy out of us. The medium-sized rocks are kind of fun, but they still take a lot of energy and they still take some time. So what would be some medium-sized rocks? Maybe extracurricular activities. Okay. Um, food. Oh, food. Well, that's kind of... I mean, it's pretty big, but... Yeah. <laughs> um, social life, maybe now. Social life, okay. Hmm. Do you have anything you have to pay for? That and... Um, your social life, maybe a car? Gasoline. Gas for your car to get you out for a social life. What else? Clothing. Any... Clothing, okay. Ooh, clothing, yeah, we don't want you going around without clothing. So the little rocks are generally the things that we love to do. They're like binging Netflix, social media, hanging out with our friends. The things that take the least amount of time are the most fun, but we want to spend the most time doing them. So what are some of yours? Going out to eat, watching movies. Okay. Social life again. All right, yeah, social life's really important. Um, buying things I like. Anything okay. I like that I see. Let's see. What else? Do y'all have anything? Isabel. My girlfriend. Yeah. Oh, your girlfriend? She's a little priority. Okay. <laughs> wow. There's a lot of things. I just can't think right now. Okay. Well, the point of the demonstration, I would dump it out, but we're going to do one more activity, and we, we got to move quickly. The point is, if you start with the big rocks, you have time for the little rocks. But I guarantee if we dump this out and we started with the little rocks and we filled up with the little rocks, you won't have time for the big we won't have space for the big rocks. And that is why it's so important to take care of the things that give you the greatest return on your investment. Take care of those things first. So you get sleep so that you're well rested for school and work. You take care of your relationships that are important. If faith is something in your life, you take care of that. Your health, exercise, fitness, eating, all of those things. Because if you don't have those in place, the other things can't come to fruition. I want to make sure I tell you a little bit about resumes. And I'm going to be completely honest with you. My master's is in technical communication. There is absolutely no way I could tell you in an hour or two how to write a resume that's going to work for you. There are people you pay hundreds of dollars to do that for you. There are classes that you take for weeks telling you how to do that. But there are a couple of things I can um, tell you that will hopefully be useful to you. So I put this image up there. What does it make you think of when you think of a resume? Unique. Unique? Different personalized. Dif different personalized. She she's why? She thinks she's great, yeah. So why is um, self-awareness, the ability to lead yourself, to lead others, to connect with others. Why is that all important to writing a resume? Um, Isn't the whole point of them to know who you are? Yeah, exactly. A resume, you are marketing yourself. You're selling your best self. You can only do that if you know who you are, you know what you want, you know what you're willing to do. You can't sell and market a product if you don't know what it is and if you don't believe in it. You are your product with your resume. So it is really important that you start at the beginning of the process, self-awareness, and, and work through those steps so that you can sell your best self when you go um, to do your resume and go into interviews. Now, I did put together some things. We can go to the next one. Um, 
that are essential for a resume, and that's a heading. Your name and your contact information. You wouldn't believe how many people submit a resume and they don't have their name, they don't have their updated contact information, maybe they have an old address, an old email address, or they have a really silly email address, like, Papa John 22. <laughs> well, Papa John 22 is a, not bad compared to some of the ones I've seen, like, you know, silly ones, like, I don't, I don't know if I can, I won't repeat them, but you can imagine, you're applying for a job or for college, so you want something that is l less on the silly side and more descriptive of yourself. A good idea is to use some form of your name, um, first initial, last name, something like that. Something that um, you'll remember for one, that you check. I know young people don't like to check email, but it's really important that you do, um, and that you have um, a number where people can contact you that is updated. I know y'all don't like voicemail either. I don't particularly like it either, but you want to make sure that your voice message is <coughs> not blasting some kind of music, that it says who the phone belongs to, and that your uh, message box is clear enough that if someone's calling you to offer you a job, they can leave you a message. So the heading, that's your contact information and your name. Objective and qualifications, um, that's what you want to do or what you are qualified to do. And then there are some examples on the, the table. I'm going to give you a, a minute to look at those. Experience, both paid and unpaid. Some of you, has anybody never worked before? No job? Well, whether or not you've had a job, you've probably done other things, whether it's in school, worked on projects, volunteer at church. There's a bunch of things that you don't realize your skills from those experiences are transferable. And there are people who can help you express that in a resume, but experience is extremely important to include. Your education, and you can include any honors, awards, or relevant courses that you've taken. So if you are applying for a healthcare internship, and I'm drawing a blank on your, your name, Did you, you wanted healthcare? What would be a course that you might include on your resume? Have you taken biology? Forensics, exactly. What would be a course you would include? Anatomy, exactly. You want to make sure you include those things. They are relevant and they are important. Um, other sections, you can include skills. You can include references. However, I caution you, always ask somebody before you put them down as a reference. Because Emma may put Miss Carrie as a reference but Emma never turned her work in on time. She showed up late to the meetings, and she didn't do this. But if she had, and someone called me for a reference for her for college or for a job, I wouldn't lie to them. Now, I wouldn't say anything bad about her, but I would suggest that they call another reference. That, you know. So you want to make sure that you talk to somebody before you put them down as a reference and that it's somebody who's going to give you a good reference. So those are just a, cother, a couple other um, things that you would want to include. I put three examples, and real quickly, in your group, I want you to look at these three resumes, and I want you to rate them. You can write it right on there. One, two, and three. Which resume do you like the best? That's number one. Number two, and then three you like the least. Do it quickly, we only got a few minutes. from one, two, and three. All right, we're gonna start back here. Tell us, hold up your resume. Tell us what you liked as number one. It has more visual. Hey, let's pay attention. Let's pay attention. It was more visual. What kind of job do you think that would be good for? Web designer. Okay, and how do you know that? Because it says it right there. All right, where does that fall into those, those um, Essential elements. It's not up there. We'd have to go back a slide. The heading or the objective, right? Because that's what the person is. That's what they're looking to do, right? Okay. What's number two? Meg. Okay. Why do you like Meg? 
Alright, Meg is just, she wants to be a sales executive, so she has her experiences listed out, like the job she's had that qualified for the, for the sales, so she was a sales executive, an accountant, a specialist, and then she has her education, she just has all of her, everything listed out. Okay. Timeline, that was where I was going. Timeline, chronological order? What's number three, you? Uh, Janet, I mean, she's got everything, it's just not appealing. No, appealing in what way? The information. You didn't have a lot of time to read it, so what's not appealing? Doesn't look good. Doesn't look good. <laughs> Black and white. I didn't know. <laughs> okay, I got you. Well, the other ones use infographics and stuff like that, so you got information at a glance. So I see why you liked them. Ladies, give us your one, two, and three. Hey, let's pay attention. We're gonna move in real fast here. One, two, and three. This is our one. All right. Why do you like Meg? Um, it's very organized. And she shows where she like went to school and like order and everything. And she's very efficient with her stuff. Okay. So two. You guys put Janet at two. What do you think of Janet? Uh, I just I think it's um, the simpleness of it. Just very straightforward. The highlights are yeah. Okay. Very straightforward. Great. Hey, let's pay attention. Um, I think we put this one as last because it seems like some of the information is kind of like irrelevant. Maybe use a filler or okay. Not really relevant. Okay, great. Different perspectives. Um, <laughs> we had Matthew Phillips as number one. Okay, what'd you like about Matthew? Well, he wants to be a graphic designer, and that's kind of cool because like that just sounds interesting, you know. When he used a lot of graphics. Yeah, and the way it's, it's outlined and all the information and stuff like yeah. that. He like okay. gives you like little percentages, like statistics. statistics. Okay. All right, great. Who'd you do as number two? Janet. All right. Would Janet you? is number two because she just gives you titles. Like she tells you what she's about to like talk about in her thing. You know, it's like under it, like she gives the main topics mm -hmm. and then gives a little um, easy to follow. Okay. Yeah. Easy to follow. And then Meg, Meg's is like good. It's just like really spread out and it tells you like how well she is at listening and creativity. Not that good so. She put forward. Yeah. yeah, she really. Oh. Got herself up she, she, she didn't. What did you? She didn't. She gave herself. She didn't like really like. Yeah. Give herself like. That Seems confidence that people want to see, or and she's going yeah. for a sales executive, and she put four for budgeting. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right, good. You were gonna say something. I've got some. Okay. All right, great. And what about you guys? What? How did you rank your resumes? We rated Janet Gray first. Let's listen. Meg second, and Matthew Phillips third. Okay. Ooh, what'd you like Janet first? We like Janet because she was kind of to the point. Like the most important information about a resume is what you do and who you are. And I feel like the rest of these are just like decorative and fancy when they shouldn't have. It was just, it worked with just information gives them. Okay, and who was number two? Um, Meg. Okay, because she was a little in between. Yeah. And then Matthew was more visual. It was too cluttered. Infographic. Okay, all right, great. All of your answers are right. Um, and it's important to understand that about a resume. There are standard elements, your heading, your objective or your purpose, uh, your experience, um, your education. Those are all critical elements to include. However, no resume format works perfectly for everyone. So you need to start with who you are and you need to know who your audience is, who you're applying with. Matthew, if he's applying for a graphic design job, that might be great because he's showing that he can use graphics. Janet is very traditional. If she's applying for a government job or education job, they might appreciate that a little bit more. It's just very clean and straight to the point. So there's no one right answer. What is fantastic about the time that y'all live in is that you have so many sources out there that you can tap into that will help you find something that works for you. And that's what I gave you um, on your top three resume resources. These are my top three.
H Loom, and the reason why it's number one is because it offers you 200, more than 275 free resume templates. You should be able to find something within about 300 templates that would work for you and for the job you're applying for. Google Docs, who has a Gmail? Yes, you have access to so many documents already online that are um, templated for your, for your resume. And then cover letters and resumes. These are downloadable templates, so again, more options. But the great thing about this site is that it allows you to flush out certain sections. So you may add a section about skills, or you may add a section about awards or references, and it'll give you pointers on how to do that um, better. Um, lastly, we're going to talk real quick about interviews and um, the art of interviewing, and it is an art. Uh, it's an opportunity to present your best self. How long does it take to make a first impression? The very Not first long second. At all. A second, a glance, first second. Glimpse. Glimpse. What do you notice in a first impression? It takes about 30 seconds for a general person. What you're wearing, what you look like, what else? Smile. Facial expression. Okay. Great. So, facial expression, smiling, how you speak, how you dress, all those things. What do they have in common? They're all outwardly, nonverbal. They're what? They make up your appearance. They are all. All of those things are right. But most importantly, they are all things that we control. I walk into a room and I decided what I was going to wear. I decide if I'm going to make con eye contact with you and shake your hand. If I'm going to speak clearly and loud enough for you to hear. So what does that tell you? If those are all things that you told me, you notice about somebody in the first 30 seconds, what does that tell you about a first impression? Very important. It's important, but you control it. You can decide the first impression that you make. You own those 30 seconds. So it's really, really important if you want to make a good impression that you own those 30 seconds and control the things that you can control. So those are some questions about the art of interviewing. I put to, there's a little video that I want to show you. Um, I think it's next. Um, we'll dim the lights for a second. But these are some, it's some clips of uh, interviews. There's no jobs for manager, it's just for counter. Good. I'm looking for the least possible amount of responsibility. Mr. Huff, Mr. Giner is ready for your interview. Actually, we'll be interviewing as a team. We are all in this together. And I wanted to put across the general idea rather than the details. Like, people get all hung up on details. Like, which school did I go to? How many openings did I get? Could be like six, could be none. It's not important. What is important is that I am, yes? Do you have any special skills? Oh, yes. I do. I, I do voices. What are your skills, girls? Oh, we can dance. <laughs> you mean like dancing? We're really good dancers. Yes! We've come to this planet looking for intelligent life. Oops, we made a mistake. We're happy to be in America. Don't ask for a green card. <laughs> I want you in the worst way. Mr. Masuhisu. Matsu. Masi. Matsu Moto. Moto. Martha, can I call you Martha? No, you may not. Okay. Uh, human resources lady. Oh, oh no, think... it, it's actually, it's Pam. I'm sorry. Well, Pan. No, my name is Pam. Are you saying Pan or Pam? I'm saying Pam. Yeah, I'm sorry, who is this gentleman sitting behind you? Hello, Ms. Lady. I have fast food experience. <laughs> yeah, like 20 years ago. Do you have any experience? No, sir, I have no experience, but I'm a big fan of money. I like it. I use it. I have a little. I keep it in a jar on top of my refrigerator. I'd like to put more in that jar. That's where you come in. We're not generally comfortable in an office setting, I would say. I get cooped up. Not so task-oriented. Not a workhorse. I also get headaches from computers, so I can't be around them for too long. I take stuff. If you're looking for a Clydesdale, I'm probably not your, your man. We're slow learners, and we're not particularly good listeners. That'll be, a, that'll be a huge problem. We're also slow learners. What's your policy on Columbus Day? Yeah, uh, we, we work. Really? 
the guy discovered the new world. Nobody in this town works without a retainer, guys. You think you can find somebody who does, we tell you you have my blessing. But I think we all know that person's not going to represent you as well as I can. Will, our offer is $84,000 a year. Retainer! Retainer. Let's do this, you know? You guys are hired. You're in, you know? Unless you're like the weirdest guys ever and I don't see it. Great. I thank you for your time. Actually, sir, I really need this job to impress a girl. Will you leave now, please? Please leave this office. We're done with this interview. Do we get any sort of souvenir? Get out of my office! Hey, we tried, right? Thanks a lot. Yeah. Get my resume. <laughs> All right. I don't have to ask you about, because I heard y'all laughing at some of the things. I don't have to ask you what worked and what didn't. I know some of those things rang for you because I heard y'all laughing. And it is funny. Um, we could go through all the things that they did wrong, but I want to focus on what it is that you can do right. So I put together my top 10 tips to getting you hired. And that's do your homework. Know who you're interviewing with. Just like your resume, you need to understand the audience. You need to understand who you're interviewing with. You should know something about that company and why you want to work there, what you can contribute. Dress to impress and dress appropriately. Sometimes that's business attire. Sometimes um, it's not. But whatever you're dressed in, make sure that you have it put together. Arrive earlier on time. We talked about that, why that's important. Smile. Make Good eye contact. You're talking directly to somebody in an interview, and it's important that, th that they um, feel a connection with you. That goes back to connecting with people and why that's important. Greet with a firm handshake, connecting with people. Speak clearly. Who understood what the one Irish guy was saying? Did anyone understand? No, you can't understand anything he's saying. Answer the questions honestly. So as you guys criticized uh, Meg, was it Meg? Yes. For, for ranking herself kind of low, but if she gave herself all fives, she's saying she has no room to improve either. So you need to answer questions honestly in an interview and be honest on your resume. Bring a copy of your resume. I think it's pretty funny the guy grabbed it off of his desk before he left too. And then ask questions if you're given a chance. And there are resources online that help you prepare for interviews that give you some idea of good questions that you can ask if you um, go on an interview. The best advice that I could give you for interviewing is practice. And that means, I say practice makes progress. The more job interviews that you can go on or practice doing through some events at Think Academy or, or other, other places that allow you to do mock interviews, college interviews, the more you can practice talking about who you are what you want to do, what your goals are, the more natural that will come to you and that will be the image that you portray and you'll be surprised how effective that is um, at helping you get where you want to go on, on the road to, to, to life. So I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Pike. Thank you so much for your attention. I had a lot of fun spending time with you. Guys, before, and we're going to be real short on the college thing, this probably should have been two or three different sessions, um, but before we go into that, there's one thing I want to add that Carrie was talking about, because I sit on the other side of the table, and every year I interview people who are coming, wanting to come and work at Think, and answer questions. But let me add to that. Be sure that you're answering the question that is asked because so often I can't tell you how many educated adults will speak for 10 minutes but never answer the question that was asked. And, and we're all biased. We all have our own biases. But as one on the interview team, that is a bias of mine that gets rid of a lot of points right there because to me it tells me that they weren't even listening to what I was asking them. So that's a big thing that I would tell you in an interview. All right, so this is going to be really, really quick and short, but I want to start because most everybody in here except with for one, I think, your your um, juniors or seniors, right? So raise your hand if you're a senior. Okay. Now keep your hand raised if you've already applied for college. Okay, so 
Um, we talked earlier about knowing what you're good at, knowing what you're interested in, and aligning that with what you want to do, making sure that those align. Guys, you need to use that as your compass, too, for what you want to do once you get out of high school, because you do have other options. You know, four-year colleges are great. They're not made for everybody, and, and skilled laborers are really underrated because they always have a job, whereas four-year degree seekers sometimes don't have a job or they have hundreds of thousands of dollars in student loans and they're making 20000 a year. So you have to know what you're interested in and what, what is best for you, okay? And again, there are different paths to get to the end goal. You said aviation mechanic, right? The first thing that popped in my head when you said that is military, that's your route to it right there, Air Force. Um, now, I'm not saying that's the route you have to take. There are tons of them, but that would be a free route for you, okay? So anyway, um, do, your, do your homework ahead of time in terms of what you want to do and what your options are. And that's one of the thing, things that this young man right now, Mr. Paul, right? Last name was Paul that this young man is, is kind of at the crossroads of is which schools offer aviation mechanics. There aren't going to be many in Georgia. I can, I can let him know that right away. Um, so how many of you, okay, how many of you have a Georgia Futures account? If you are a Troop County school person, you have a Georgia Futures account. You set it up when you were in the eighth grade or seventh grade or sixth grade, one of them. Um, Y'all, Georgia Futures, and, and if you're private school, Georgia Futures, you need to get you a Georgia Futures account. This is going to be the best resource that you can use. Those of you who have a Georgia Futures account, how many of you have really used it? I'm not talking about using it to apply for your funding application for dual enrollment. Okay, I'm not talking about doing the assessments that you had to do because your teacher made you do it. I'm talking about how many of you have really gone to Georgia Futures, you've investigated the programs that are at different colleges, both in state and out of state, you've looked at tuition cost, you've looked at financial aid, you've looked at scholarships. One, I can't tell you enough how important this resource is. I'm just going to pull it up very quickly because I want to show you one thing. If you go over here to resources, and you scroll down, this, this website will put your, and also this is what calculates your Hope and Zell GPAs, by the way. This is where it uploads to, okay? But this will put your transcript out there to any college in Georgia that you want it to go to. It is a connection to every college in Georgia. You can also access universities outside of Georgia, but basically what it does with those is it just takes you to those websites, okay? But if you go to scholarships, and we just did a search. Uh, let me see if it'll let me just do it randomly. Uh, you can search by um, specific scholarships that they have. Uh, this might not do it. Anyway, if you go and just do a random search and pull it up, it will pull up over 22,000 scholarships that are, that are available right now. I did it this morning. Okay? Over 22,000. Now, some of them are, are $1,000 scholarships, but if you get the hope, and the hope's not going to pay for everything, you get the hope, and then you get four or $5,000 scholarships a semester, it adds up. A lot of people will get to their senior year, and they say, oh, I'm only going to apply for the big scholarships. Big mistake, because guess what? Everybody else is applying for those scholarships too, so they're extremely highly competitive. You have a greater chance of getting those thousand and fifteen hundred dollar scholarships and again they add up so don't don't just um, leave them by the wayside they're important going back to this resources page y'all I want everybody like that should be your homework if you're a junior or a senior actually that should be your homework as a ninth grade student
because that's where your first research begins. That's what's going to connect you to colleges. Um, I wanted to say a whole lot of stuff here, too, about ACT and SAT, and I'm just running out of time. But do your, um, do your homework on ACT and SAT. Start taking it early. You don't have to be ready to take it the first time you take it. Take it early. Take both of them so that you'll know which one you perform best on. Um, and then just continue to take that one that you take the best and make efforts to improve every time you take it. But take both of them. Some people do extremely better on the ACT than they do on the SAT, okay? The tests are very different. They're formatted differently. Um, develop a plan of action for your senior year. Honestly, this should again start your ninth grade year. I know several of you are because I recognize your names, but who all's enrolled with dual enrollment right now? It's, it's a great plan. Lots of pros to dual enrollment, right? How many of you know the cons to dual enrollment? Anybody think of cons? If you were to go to like an LL school, your credit from Georgia wouldn't probably be there. Okay, faults. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you why. If you were to go to an Alabama school, your credit wouldn't follow you there. Uh-huh, some, some Alabama schools, especially four-year universities, it will. We can't guarantee it because we don't have an articulation agreement with them. But Auburn University accepts almost all of Troop County's dual enrollment credits. Um, I don't know, but this is what I tell everybody. No matter if you're taking dual if you're going to take dual enrollment, you're in dual enrollment, and you know that you want to go to a school outside of Georgia, you call them. They have an admissions office full of people who are ready to answer those questions. But that's going to fall on you to do it, okay? So they may not. We're not going to guarantee that they accept the credit, but they may, and a lot do, okay? Any other cons that you can think of? And I'm a pro, I'm an advocate for dual enrollment, okay? But I think it's important that everybody knows the pros and the cons. Doesn't mess up your home GPA if you like make a bad grade? Sure does. And a lot of people don't know that. So all of these courses, so all the courses that you're taking towards dual enrollment, they're not going towards your hope hours. You're still going to get 127 Semester hours, I think it is, for the approved HOPE scholarship. But if you fail a course, that is impacting your college GPA. So when you take a course in college, you're actually working on two different GPAs, your high school GPA and your college GPA. And that's where it can have a negative impact on your HOPE. A lot of people, what you don't realize too, this happened to a student that I had to talk to yesterday about. She's failing in a course. She didn't realize that she was going to have two Fs for that course. Okay? She's taken a course through dual enrollment that I can't move her into in the public school, either at Think or at the base school because it's not offered. So she's going to have an F on her college transcript and she's going to have an F on her high school transcript. It's knocking her out of distinguished honor grad and it may drop her down below a 3.0, okay? So um, now I'm not telling you that to make you afraid. I encourage you to do dual enrollment. I'm telling you that so you'll know the facts. Um, I always tell people start dual enrollment the summer between your 10th, 11th grade and the summer when you don't have anything else to do. Take one class, see how it feels to you, um, and then go from there. Um, but be careful with it. All right, I've already gone through that. Um, will they transfer? What are the requirements for dual enrollment? Varies. By, by school that you may dual, dually enroll in. Um, but I want to say again, I want to go back to um, different requirements, different schools. Y'all, once you know what you might want to do and you research the schools that offer those reputable programs there, then I really think that one of the most important things you can do is make an appointment or call them and talk to an admissions counselor. Um, and ask them the questions that you want to ask them. I'm going to give you another example of why that's important. Um, anybody in here want to go to tech? 
Okay. Georgia Tech, great school. You've got a brother that graduated from there, don't you? Uh, oh, okay, okay. Um, so I'm just going to tell you something about uh, Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech will accept the dual enrollment credits because they're articulated to accept them. But you can take college algebra, you can take pre-cal, you can take calculus, and you can take them at Columbus State University, or you can take them at West Georgia Technical College. They're going to go. They're going to transfer to Georgia Tech. But Georgia Tech's not going to accept them as a math credit. They're going to accept them as an elective credit. That's fine because you need electives in college, elective hours to graduate from college too. But don't go in there thinking that they're going to accept them as your maths. They're not. They're going to make you take Georgia Tech math. Okay? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I want to like calculus or something. So another thing I want to tell you too that's really important. Wherever you're wanting to go, especially if you're wanting to go to um, a, a university system of Georgia College, UGA, Kennesaw, Columbus State's pretty much going to accept, you know, those, the smaller schools. But if you're looking at a larger school, um, I would absolutely call them and I would ask them, do you prefer dual enrollment credit or AP, IB, we don't have IB in Troop County, but AP credit? Because some schools will tell you that they want a student to exhaust their AP options before they start dual enrollment. Some schools will tell you they prefer dual enrollment. And when you start applying and having interviews for scholarships and writing resumes for college, because really that's kind of what you're doing on an application, those things are going to be important because when you have a 4.0 or a 3.8 GPA and four other people do too, it's going to be those kind of things that determines who gets in. Okay? So know before you go. So important. So this is just something to know about early in regard to scholarships, and I think this is the last one or close to the last one. Um, there are lots of different scholarship databases out there. Georgia Futures connects you to some of them. Go ahead and connect with those databases early. Create you an email account that is just for scholarships because you're going to get a whole lot of junk email. When you start accessing those databases for scholarships, it's going to, they're going to start sending you emails for everything, okay? You still need to check them because that's where you're going to find information. But you're going to get a lot of junk email too, so um, it is recommended that you create an email account specifically for that. Um, prepare early to apply for scholarships. Um, most of your bigger scholarships have, will have a deadline around March the 1st, but a lot of them you can apply for earlier than that, but you need to be ready to apply for them. That means you have to know about them earlier and get your application in as soon as possible because some scholarships um, will kind of give money on a first-come, first-served basis, okay? Um, begin with local scholarships. They're less competitive. Beware of pitfalls that will automa automatically make you ineligible for the scholarship. Things we don't think about. Two examples, if it asks for one reference and you give three, many scholarships will mark you ineligible just for that. In your essay, if it asks you for 250 words, don't give 257. You know, sometimes we don't think about those things. But a scholarship committee, they're looking to see if these applicants are following the directions first. If they're not following by the guidelines, they throw them out. Um, market yourself for almost any scholarship, especially the big ones, you're going to have to write an essay. Just like going through the interview process, just like having your resume, you want to catch them. You want to use a hook when you're writing the essay. You want to start out with a hook to make yourself stand out immediately. All right? All right, that was really, really quick because I wanted to go through Georgia Futures kind of step by step or tab by tab, but that's okay. Do y'all have any questions for me or for Carrie? No questions? Um, 
Okay, so say if you go to a private school that doesn't offer guidance counselors and you have to kind of figure everything out on your own, what do you suggest the student does? Even if you go to a private college, they're going to have admissions counselors. They may not have as many, so you may have to kind of insist on setting up an appointment, but usually they're going to let you do it. You might have to wait a little longer, but they're going to let you set that appointment up because they want you. They want your money, okay? Guys, also know the difference with Hope Zell Miller. Know the difference in what they pay to private versus public schools. There's a big difference. You need to know that, okay? Any other questions? What were you going to say about ACT and SAT earlier? Um, well, I really just kind of wanted to talk to you about the importance of starting those, two, really what I said quickly, starting the test early. Um, yeah, I, I usually say 10th grade, the fall of 10th grade year, start taking them so that you can really find out which one you do the best on and then put your efforts in improving in those areas, okay? You really, I mean, everybody wants to shoot for that 28 composite ACT score for Zell Miller. I mean, that's like a big, big thing. But there are a lot of other things outside of that. All right, anything else? All right, does anybody else, are we good? All right, thank y'all so much. Y'all been a great group. We hope that you leave with something.